Our, our next speaker is going to be a young designer, team. and um, Patrick uh, is the designer of uh, and maker of his own particle accelerator, which was um, which was such an intriguing idea that I thought I've really got to invite him along because the particle accelerators I know about are things like CERN, uh, massive international multi-billion decades long endeavors so uh, the thought of having a DIY one was particularly fascinating so we can go to the talk. Hi uh, so yeah I'm a designer by trade but uh, I've always had a bit of a fascination with, with science a bit of a self-confessed physics geek and uh, it sort of informs quite a lot of my work um, so yeah, tonight I'm hopefully going to be explaining how I tried to become a particle physicist in two weeks and uh, show how maybe other people can you know, do a bit of particle physics themselves and show that it's not maybe quite as hard as you think. So the first project um, that I started on this theme was one called On Our Way to the Impossible and it was really just titled that because as you would expect, most people, whenever I said I wanted to become a particle physicist, said that it was impossible. Um, but I wanted to sort of show that I didn't need a physics degree to do a bit of particle physics myself. My sort of love of and fascination, I suppose, of particle physics began by uh, seeing images of, of this place, which is the Large Hadron Collider. This is probably the most famous piece of particle physics. Um, it's been in the media a lot in recent, recent weeks and months as uh, they've recently discovered a brand new particle that was only uh, a piece of theory beforehand. And it's one of the sort of building blocks of the universe. And uh, this is a picture of inside one of the detectors that they use to actually try and discover what our universe is really made from. Um, the whole structure itself is uh, its a massive ring, it's a donut shape, 27 kilometres in circumference, um, it sort of crosses the French and Swiss border there. And uh, it's uh, a huge complex and they run quite a lot of different experiments there. And, but basically the way that it works is that they take um, particular particles called protons, which are one of the sort of fundamental building blocks of our universe. And they get them accelerating at close to the speed of light. And at that point, they collide them together uh, inside these detectors that you just saw there. And uh, they observe what happens and hope that they can get an idea of you know, what makes up our, our universe. Uh, they had a bit of a bigger budget to build their particle accelerator than I did. Um, they had a few billion pounds. I didn't have quite that much, so I knew that there was going to be a few sort of compromises I was going to have to make, and a few sort of subtle differences that would uh, be between my accelerator and theirs. So I started thinking about, you know, how on earth was I actually going to build a particle accelerator? Um, and uh, as I said before, in CERN they accelerate particles called protons, which are relatively heavy and hard to actually get accelerating. But uh, through research and uh, talking through uh, the idea with a number of physicists, uh, I decided that um, I would actually be able to accelerate particles called electrons. And they're a lot lighter than protons and uh, a lot freer and so a lot more uh, readily, uh, well, in a state that's a lot more easy to accelerate. So these were some few initial sketches about how I was actually going to do this. Um, so. After quite a lot of uh, prototyping, intense prototyping, uh, I finally made this first model, uh, first working model. Um, it was a really sort of stressful process. Uh, as I said, I only had two weeks to actually design and build this accelerator. Um, and uh, it was a lot of sleepless nights. But basically the way that this works is um, at the far end here, there is a connection to a vacuum pump and uh, another connection to a high voltage power supply that supplies about 45,000 volts. 
So it's a lot of energy to get these, these electrons actually accelerating. And in the, the middle here is uh, another metal loop, and that is the opposite connection to the electrical connection at the end. And that's the target that the electrons are actually accelerated towards. So they're ripped off the end up here and accelerated down the tube. And the reason I only had two weeks to actually build this um, was because I was exhibiting it just down the road from here actually uh, last year at London Design Week. And uh, it was a chance for me to, to show this piece to an audience that would normally shy away from physics and uh, a lot of people you know, hadn't heard of a particle accelerator before, didn't know anything about it or how it worked. Um, but for me, the real idea of the project, apart from being able to just build a particle accelerator, was to actually get people, members of the public, um, interested in science and try and sort of pass on some of my enthusiasm and passion for the subject in a way that came naturally to me by making something physical. And uh, it was really, really well received. I was amazed actually. I thought most people would just walk on by and not really be interested by it at all. But uh, the popularity of the piece was, well, it was uh, overwhelming to me anyway. And uh, at that point, I thought that my sort of excursion into the world of particle physics was, was probably done. It had been a really stressful time for me, and it wasn't something that I really wanted to uh, take part in again. But one of the people that actually came to see the exhibition was a guy called Chris, who runs a science communication company in London called Super Collider. And uh, he was fascinated by the piece and uh, wanted to commission me to actually produce uh, another version of it for uh, a later event. Um, I'll just explain here the colours that you can see inside the tube, uh, this sort of purpley pinky light that's created. Um, it's a, a plasma, it's called, and um, it's actually created by the, uh, as the electrons travel down the tube at uh, really high speeds, they uh, collide with some of the air molecules that remain inside the glass after it's been uh, pumped out. Um, and this, these collisions uh, create this plasma uh, that you see swirling around inside the glass. Um, but yeah, as I said, this was a really sort of stressful project to try and do in two weeks' time. Um, so the biggest thing that I got from this was to really you know, know when to get help. Uh, I got a lot of help on this from um, one physicist uh, at Cambridge in particular. And uh, I think he was probably one of the only people mad enough to agree to help me out on this. Um, but definitely, if I hadn't had his sort of scientific background, it would have been a lot more difficult to actually produce. So the, the second iteration of the project uh, was this handcrafted particle accelerator. And initial ideas, uh, chatting with Chris, was to basically upscale the previous previous design. Um, the first design was about uh, a metre long, um, but Chris wanted to bulk it up a bit and get it to about five or six metres. But this soon became apparent that it wasn't going to work. and It was just uh, the sort of uh, requirements to get a piece of glass like that was just, uh, it was too difficult and there was a lot of other sort of technical issues that would mean that it just wouldn't really be a feasible option. So um, the idea that I came up with uh, instead was to hand blow some pieces of glass that would form uh, our very own unique organically shaped vacuum chambers and particle accelerators. For me, one of the things that attracted me to this particular piece of science was that uh, I thought it was quite a beautiful experiment in its own right. Uh, apart from just being scientifically interesting. Um, but I really wanted to sort of question the aesthetics of science. I think um, science is often portrayed in a very uh, specific way, very uh, geometric and angular, sort of like the first, the first piece. 
Um, but I wanted to sort of question why it always needed to be portrayed in that way, and could we sort of uh, show science's aesthetic beauty as well as just its theoretical side? Um, so this is why I wanted to create these sort of organic, organic accelerators. Unfortunately, the, the event wouldn't let us hang these from the roof, um, so we had to compromise, and the design then became to create some sort of tabletop ones instead. Um, but I had to make a few subtle sort of changes for this, uh, for this piece. Um, so in this design, the, uh, the end, uh, oh, at, the, at the open end of the, the vacuum chamber, there's a, a rubber bung, and in that bung is uh, an aluminium pipe. And that's connected to the vacuum pump, and that basically sucks out all the air inside, or as much air as possible. And the reason why you try and suck out as much air as possible is to really just create an environment that lets the electrons accelerate inside without bumping into too many other uh, particles. It's similar in the way that if, if you think if you tried to walk down Oxford Street on a busy Saturday afternoon, you wouldn't really get very far. Um, the other piece of uh, wire up here is, is the other electrode, and that basically is the target. That's what rips off the electrons uh, from the aluminium tube, um, because b between the two pieces of metal, there's a difference of about uh, 45,000 volts. Um, so it's that force that's created that actually gets these electrons accelerating inside the tube. So the, the two main pieces of the accelerator is uh, the electron gun and then the glass vacuum chamber. The electron gun is really the source of the electrons um, and that's what produces this stream of particles that uh, you're accelerating around. So these were just a few initial sketches about how I was actually going to create this and uh, the different alternatives. One of the things that um, was really important for me in this project was to try and get as hands-on into every aspect as I could. You know, I said I was going to make a particle accelerator, so I wanted to do all of it myself. Um, from the electronics to actually the, the powering of the device to the physical craftsmanship of the piece. Um, and one of the things that, that meant was learning how to glass blow. Um, so I'd never done glass blowing before, but I was uh, really lucky um, that I was able to go to a place called Harlow, which is in uh, north of London, and uh, a really nice little idyllic uh, glass blowing cottage. And um, so I went to the glass blower and had a few drawings and uh, he wanted to know what I was making, so I started to tell him that I was uh, building my own particle accelerator. And I think his jaw just dropped. He didn't really, he didn't really know what was going to be required of him. Um, but these are some of the, the early prototypes that we started to blow. And uh, getting this sort of physical connection to the pieces uh, literally was wet and almost blood and tears. Um, blowing these pieces of glass, it meant uh, I had a, a much stronger connection to the pieces than if I just outsourced these. Um, I've got a short video that I can just show of the, of the process. So this was in the, uh, the glass blowing studio and uh, like I said, it's something that I've never done myself before and it's a really physical uh, job. I've got a real uh, admiration for the guys who do this every day. It was freezing sort of mid-January when we were doing this. It was, you know, frost outside but we were both in there just in, like shorts and t-shirt and um, it's unlike any sort of material that I've really used before. 
you really have to know exactly every step that you're going to make before you even begin because there's no thinking time involved at all. Um, <coughs> so it was uh, quite an experience for me to be able to actually go and do this as part of the project. Um, I'll just skip forward a little bit. So these are the sort of initial, initial images of the, these glass orbs just beginning to form. It's being a bit juttery, so I might just. Yeah, so here you can sort of see them taking shape. And uh, the way that we created this sort of flat surface on the bottom um, was just by using a piece of sodden wood, a sleeper, a railway sleeper, and then uh, the steam that's produced as you rub the, uh, the hot glass over the wood actually helps shape the glass into the, this sort of organic shape that we wanted to create. But um, after I sort of had the glass blowing done, and I thought, you know, this is the, the main hurdle over, surely. Um, the next thing that emerged was, uh, well, we had a lot of trouble with the actual vacuum pump that was meant to be sucking all the air out from these pieces of glass to create the vacuum chamber inside. This is the type of pump that we had to work with. It's called a, a two-stage rotary pump. And the way that it works is similar to um, just sucking a straw to uh, you know, have a drink. It uh, basically just sucks out the stream of air, but it relies on a, a, you know, there being enough air to keep that um, sort of flow of air molecules uh, being pumped out. And through talking to a number of physicists in the project, uh, it, they were all saying that this was not going to be enough, that it was no way going to work, that this type of pump was not suitable for the job whatsoever, and basically just, you know, stop the project now. This was the type of pump that they were saying that we needed to use, which is called a diffusion pump, and it works in a very different way, and uh, it basically rips the air molecules from inside, um, and it doesn't require the same sort of density of air at all. Um, but after a long time hunting and searching and begging various universities to try and get one of these, uh, we had no luck whatsoever. And this was a real sort of moment of tribulation for me, and I thought, you know, is this project actually going to happen at all? Um, I think all of us were very worried that we saw the deadline approaching and we still had no working particle accelerators. Um, but I was determined to sort of keep going with the project and uh, try and come up with any sort of alternatives that we could to make it actually a workable piece. Um, so these are all the parts that <coughs> you really need to make a particle accelerator. And it doesn't look like an awful lot, and uh, to be honest, it isn't an awful lot. And uh, all of the pieces there really are readily available. There's nothing apart from the glass that was you know, hand blown. And uh, the electronics up at the top right there, which were handmade. But everything else is just off the shelf components. And it's really just knowing the, the way to put them together. Um, with this project, you know, apart from just looking at the, the aesthetics of the science, I wanted to show that anyone can really do some quite sophisticated science with very sort of rudimentary, I suppose, materials. And it's very similar to um, the sort of period of enlightenment when you had these sort of gentlemen scientists who would be doing uh, experiments, you know, in their, in their sheds or, well, maybe not sheds, but in their parlors and uh, they would be actually, you know, the pioneers and the forefathers of the sort of modern scientific understanding that we have today. And it's very similar to the way that they worked. 
So this is just a, a sketch that I made for the other guys in uh, Super Collider to show them my ideas about how we might actually be able to make this work after receiving the, the horrible news that uh, the pump that we'd spent money on was not right. But, yeah, uh, eventually I, you know, I persisted and uh, this was the sort of final piece or one of the final pieces that we took to Milan. Um, you can see the same sort of pinky purpley glow, but uh, at the far end here, you can see a sort of yellow green tinge. And what you're seeing there is actually the electrons that are accelerating, uh, crashing into this white uh, phosphorus lining inside the glass. And uh, what happens there is that the electrons react with the phosphor and emit this sort of glow um, so I was personally really, really thrilled whenever we actually turned this on for the first time and saw that it did actually work, despite being told by almost everyone that it was definitely not going to work. Um, so then we took them out to Milan and uh, exhibited them in a place called La Rinascente, and uh, that's basically the, the Harrods of Milan. And uh, it was an amazing sort of experience exhibiting these pieces in uh, this very grand department store. Um, the people, who, the audience who came along were, some people had known about the project and had come along specifically to see it. But a lot of the people were there just doing, you know, their normal weekend shopping and had no idea that this was happening. Um, so the, the response from them was incredible and uh, you can see People really got into it. There was a massive crowd by the end of the day, and uh, it was really, you know, the aim of the project to communicate this sort of beauty of science. Um, I think really came across as the project was sort of immersed with all these other sort of designer goods. It looked uh, looked a bit of a juxtaposition, but it worked really well. So yeah, but basically from this project, what I learned was uh, yeah, know when to listen and know when to be stubborn. If I had sort of just given up whenever the physicist told me that the pump wasn't going to work, the project would have never happened. Um, but sometimes you just have to sort of stick to your gut. And uh, yeah, even though I should have probably researched all the details a bit more to avoid that situation happening in the first place, um, I'm really happy with how, how it turned out. Thanks. Um, what's the difference between your um, accelerator and uh, the cathode ray tube? Yeah, no, it works in the same way as a cathode ray tube. So, like I was saying, it's accelerating uh, electrons rather than the big particle accelerators that you know primarily use protons. Um, so we, the project was never about sort of challenging the likes of CERN, but it was about showing that you know some still quite interesting science can be done in a very sort of uh, I don't know, in, in a way that's using very sort of basic materials and um, science that's rooted in the sort of uh, the foundations of work like the Crookes tube and uh, like the CRT. Um, but it's bringing that to a very different audience, like an audience at uh, a top end department store in Milan or like an audience in, uh, you know, London Design Week who would normally never interact with science in this way. Um, it was about showing the sort of beauty of science rather than trying to necessarily push the boundaries of our understanding of uh, particle physics. Could you have got any uh, bits out of an old television to help? Uh, well, yes, that would have been a help, I suppose. I mean, um, the, a lot of the power source was from uh, an ignition coil from you know old cars, for instance. So. Uh, I definitely wasn't opposed to recycling parts from bits and pieces. Another question? Is there in the <laughs> um, you said you were a designer, <clears throat> you have a design background. Can you talk a little bit about, did design influence this project at all? Did you bring any of those skills to bear? Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm yeah, a, a product designer, um, my, my background, and I think you can see from the two different sort of prototypes, they've got really sort of uh, juxtaposing aesthetics. The first one is very angular and quite sleek and 
you know, almost clinical, I would say, and that sort of, I suppose, the aesthetic to a lot of these um, art science projects and collaborations. And it was very consciously a designed piece, a designed object, and um, I think it was its aesthetics that drew a lot of people to it initially in London Design Week. But I really wanted to go to the opposite end of the spectrum for the second piece and let the sort of um, the free flow of the sort of handcrafted nature of it sort of emerge. Um, I, you know, I could have gone to a scientific labware um, company, for instance, to get the pieces of glass blown, but I wanted to blow them by hand and sort of have some with imperfections and, you know, uh, not necessarily keep to a mold and let the sort of the, the manufacturing process uh, help shape the aesthetics of it. So I think both pieces were definitely designed, um, but in just very different ways. Hi, um, I was wondering, after particle physics, what's the next step for you? Have you got something in mind? <laughs> yeah, well, um, actually, I'm working on quite a lot of different uh, pieces at the minute. I've split my time between doing sort of more commercial pieces and uh, then more sort of research type things like this. Um, a couple of the researchy pieces I'm doing at the minute deal with um, uh, synthetic biology and uh, bioengineering, which is you know all to do with um, the sort of human technology of altering uh, biological systems. Um, so a, a lot of the projects I'm dealing with are you know are based on that at the minute. I can't say too much unfortunately in the minute about them, but uh, yeah, hopefully in the next sort of year you'll see a couple of projects come out on that sort of topic. In London or? Yeah, in London and uh, again hopefully in Milan next year.